I need to apologize. And this apology is actually just kind of genuine. You know how people start with like fake apologies and then it's like a bait and switch when we go into the full video. But I did make quite a big error in my mutant upgrade video last week where I talked about how Mill works in that. I got the rule wrong. And it turns out the vast majority of people I've spoken to, people I talk to on Twitter about it, they all play the rule wrong. To the point that I think the rule probably needs to be changed or cleared up. Either way, the first rule I'm going to talk about in this video is clearing up that interaction. And this is going to be five other mistakes that I've noticed in recent content that people talk about that, that the vast majority of players make. These are mistakes that I almost guarantee if you're watching this, you've made one of them recently or you've made one of them at some point. If you've never made any of the mistakes and you knew them all, you're probably a judge or you're lying. What are the two? But on the topic of mistakes, before we get into the video, have you backed Magali's Kickstarter yet? Because it'd be a mistake if you haven't. That's right, one of the best artists working in Magic at the moment. Her portraits and character work is outstanding. She's famous for cards like Torch of Defiance, for example. And of course, everybody's favorite Narset that stops you drawing cards. Her new Kickstarter is running till mid-March and already hit some of its stretch goals. There are playmats and artist prints on offer, and the playmats are what tickle my fancy. All of them have had their art extended to fit the play mat and they're going to be on the stitched edged ultra pro like premium mats and it's all been done by Magali herself. Most excitingly we've got the box art from AFR which shows Dritz versus that dragon whose name I can never remember, her incredible take on Huntmaster of the Fells, a Lillian Walk of the Dead and most importantly this extended art Narset part of Veils play mat that goes so hard. This is gorgeous. There are limited edition play mats, there are prints, there is so much on offer here as part of the Kickstarter and it's being run by Original Magic Art as well who've done Kickstarter starters in the past that I've worked with that have all been incredible and fulfilled successfully. If you want to get involved, there'll be a link in the description below to go across the Kickstarter. You've just got three more days to go. Look, I'm just going to cut the music and be really clear with you. You've got three more days to go as of the this video coming out. This is like a last call. So don't make that mistake. Don't make the rules mistakes in these videos and don't make the mistake of not backing the Kickstarter and get yourself one of these gorgeous playmats if you want one. Anyway, on with the video. The mistake I made in the video about the mutant deck is I talked about cards that trigger on mill and old mill effects that aren't keyworded as mill. I recommended Consumer Aberration, which I will still hold as being a card that is good in the deck. It grows when you mill and it does some milling, but it doesn't actually do milling. It does the old mill that was not keyworded. So when you have a Mylurk Queen that says whenever one or more non-land cards are milled, draw a card and put a counter on it, I, uh, triggers only once per turn, actually the Consumer Aberration can't trigger this. Now there's gonna be a lot of ways to trigger this anywhere from actual mill effects and um, rad tokens and similar, and Consumer Aberration is just good in a mill deck if that's the way you want to go, so the recommendation is fine. But to be clear, if a card says put cards into the graveyard, that's not milling. Milling has to be literally keyworded. There are a few old cards like Consider that have had their text changed to read as new stuff. In this case, Surveil. A mill example would be the classic card from which the name comes, Millstone. Millstone now reads, target player mills to cards. And this is basically a rot they've done to all mill cards that specify a certain number. But with Consumer Aberration, it's not specific. And it'd be difficult to word it to be specific because so for example, when a Bruvac is involved, you have to generate a number from the triggered ability of the Consumer Aberration, then double that. It becomes quite complicated and awkward within the rule system. I would love them to do some sort of fix. I did tweet about them perhaps changing it so that whenever a card moves the top of the library into the graveyard, that counts as a mill one, but that's probably not very elegant and causes more problems than it solves. I'd actually rather they just divide some popular and powerful old mill cards that don't cause problems. For example, if Consuming Aberration was changed to say mill, simply because I want the new toys to interact with the old. That's the only reason. But either way, beyond what I would like to change about magic, which is a rare thing I ever say, I, I want to change formats and attitudes, but I rarely ever ask that the game rules be changed. So this is an unusual one for me. But whilst the rules remain as they are, if the card doesn't say mill, and old cards won't say mill, so check Scryfall, check Gatherer if you're born in 1981 or whatever. But yeah, check one of those online resources to check if your old card has been evolved since and use the evolved text as we go. Like I said, Millstone. No one's playing it, but it says mill. As a rule of thumb, if the card has a set mill number, it has been changed to say mill that number. Where, like a mind grind or consumer recuperation, it doesn't, it hasn't. Next up, proliferation of players. When a player proliferates, they choose any number of players or permanents with counters already on them and then put another of each kind of counter already there on those players or permanents. So in short, I went through this when talking about energy counters and rad counters already, but the mistake is so common that I want to do it a third time to really reiterate it. 
But in essence, when you choose an object, whether that be player or permanent, to uh, proliferate, you increase the counters of all types that are on it. So for example, the player, you can increase experience, poison, energy, um, radiation counters, okay? If it's a permanent, if they've got a plus one, plus one counter on it, and they've got a shield counter on it, and they've got a charge counter on it because it's some weird artifact or situation, then all of those grow as well. It's quite a rare occasion that you start on permanence, but it can happen. So for example, there might be a chimeric egg in play, and it's got a minus one, minus one counter on it from where it was a creature earlier that got one from, from a wither creature. Yes, this example is complicated, and you might want to proliferate it to shrink it further down with those minus one, minus one counters. So you go to proliferate it to shrink it, but it also might have charge counters on it, because they can store a lot of charge counters on them. And thus, you cannot choose to shrink it for the beneficial to you, and not grow the charge counter beneficial to your opponent. You have to grow both of them. That's just how proliferate works. Next up, let's talk about Teferi's Protection, a card that is often cast and the player casting will sit along the lines of ignore me, I'm not here, or nope, I'm gone. That's not true. You're still there, you just have protection from everything. But I guess really this isn't just about Teferi's Protection, the other really common case of protection from everything we will see now in games of Commander and in a lot of 1v1 formats is the One Ring. It gives you protection from everything. But some of the examples I'm about to give you mean you can get around protection. Protection doesn't stop everything, weirdly, even when it says protection from everything. As a quick note on how to understand or remember how protection works for both creatures and players, it's an acronym called DEPT. Damage, enchanted or equipped, blocked or targeted. In the case of a player, the blocked never comes up. Enchanted means you can't put a curse on them. But for damage and targeting, it's as clear as it says. If you had a spell that did damage to all players, they can't be damaged. If you were to target them with a spell, they're not a valid target. That's what protection means. What that means in practicality is you can still lose life to a lose life effect because it's not damage. Although when a player has protection from everything, it can still lose life. If you've Teferi's protection, you actually can't lose life because Teferi's protection says your life total can't change. An example of a situation where you might have protection from everything but still lose life is the one ring. And you also get hit for effects that don't target. So for example, if someone says, choose a player, they can choose you. Factor Fiction is an example of this. On top of that, your library is still there, so if something mills each player, you still get milled, although you can't be targeted. Nothing tends to target a library. Normally, if you're gonna search for someone's library, like with a bribery effect, it will target you, and thus cannot. More on bribery in a moment. But your graveyard is also there too, so if someone wants to reanimate one of your things with a rise from the grave or reanimation effect, they can do so. Those things are targetable. Furthermore, you can be attacked. You won't take damage, because damage can't be done to you, but it will trigger on attack effects. For example, Captain Anatomy Storm trigger to treasure. So a situation where you're the last player left, let's say you're playing 1v1 or a commander and other player's dead, and that player really wants their treasure token to get to that critical mass of mana, they can still declare an attack even if it won't do damage to you. But beyond that, some cards say damage can't be prevented. Like for example, Questing Beast. In amongst its text, in amongst its incredible wall of text, it has this line here. Combat damage that would be dealt by creatures you control can't be prevented. Someone might think they're sitting pretty behind a protection from the one ring, and then you just hit them with a questing beast and a bunch of creatures, damage can't be prevented, they're gonna get hurt. Really hurt. There are multiple ways to get around prevention of damage. For example, Skullcrack. Now, Skullcrack isn't exactly what you want in a 1v1 scenario when your opponent's got protection, because you, can, uh, you can't target them. However, you can shoot a different player, turn off prevention. It's kind of funny. I don't recommend playing Skullcrack, unless it's a lot of prevention life gain in your metagame. But, um... It'll tell a good story. Importantly, this scenario here where Questing Beasts can allow damage to go through but not change your life total can still kill a player who's to very protection thanks to two methods. Firstly, Infect. They can still get poison counters. It can still kill them. The life total does not change, but 10 poison counters are still lights out. Mr. Top. And then you have commander damage. If you have a commander sued up and does 21 damage, their life total doesn't change, but they are dead. And John really wanted me to include the fact that if Phage hits you and you've stopped damage prevention and they're fairy protection, Phage still triggers and kills them. That's kind of funny too. If you're playing Phage in commander, you have, you have my utmost respect. Next up, let's talk about players dying, players losing the game and what actually happens. When a player leaves the game, they exile everything that they have that is theirs. You can't hold on to things that they own. They go back into their deck box and they go with them. There is a little caveat beyond that though. Before we exile everything, the player who is losing the game, they end any gains control effects. So for example, if they've aged of treachery something away from you, you get it back, because all gain control effects end. However, your honor, there's an objection to all this. There's some complications. It's only on gain control effects. So for example, if you were to steal something with a reanimate, as we mentioned earlier when someone's to fairy protection, that card was not gained control of, it was just 
put back into play under your control. And thus, it gets exiled. Furthermore, there's more of these. Bribery. Bribery, weirdly, on the research for this video, I found out it doesn't say gain control of. I just assumed it did. I don't know why. It just feels like it does. It doesn't. So if you if you, if you you don't gain control, but kind of gain control by putting something to play out of someone's library via a bribery effect, and then you lose the game, that card goes back to your opponent. If you bribery someone Ulamog, and then they kill you in response, or not in response, but as a recompense, they get the Ulamog back. That's something I really didn't know until I started to research this video. Further to this, when a player loses, their turn still proceeds. They get exiled and everything leaves, all gain control effects end, and they go back to the player who um, controlled them before. By the way, that's another clarity effect that I almost missed out. When you end a gain control effect, you end a gain control effect. So if I gain control of your creature, but you'd stole it off someone else, it goes back to you, not the person who originally owned it. It doesn't go back to the owner, it just ends the gain control effect that I have put it under. So if I stole something that was stolen, the original stealer gets it back. But beyond that, there are steps in that turn. They don't go away, they don't disappear, they don't get exiled. So that means if you have an end of turn effect, a trigger like a flicker wisp returning something, or as a really weird example, a Kuon Ogre Ascendant, it will still trigger in the end phase of the player who has died, because that phase still exists, that turn still happens. And also I checked this, because I was doing another sanity check on my Discord, Kuon Ogre Ascendant will see creatures that died under the control of the player that lost. The player that was eliminated, they were eliminated via damage, a state-based effect, as were the creatures, they all saw each other. It all happens together. Lastly, we have the one that my comment section is convinced I'm getting wrong every time I say it, so I'm going to say it again. Replacement effects only replace the part they specify. This is about Academy Manufacturer, a card that I talk about way too much at the moment. This card will give you three permanents, a clue, a food, and a treasure whenever you make one of the aforementioned food, clue, or treasure. If a permanent were to make a tapped version of that, then the cards that you make are also tapped. That bit doesn't change. The obvious examples of this in recent time are Gala Greet is making a tapped treasure when you cast the Manufacturer. It will then make three tapped permanents, a clue, a treasure, and a food. Or more recently, we've got Nuka Cola Vending Machine is a card that I can't stop talking about, thinking about, and wanting to play. That will, when you sack a food, create a tapped treasure, and thus make you a tapped treasure, tapped food, and tapped clue. The tapped part doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't replace that. It only replaces the permanent being made. And again, it's just, it's it's like it's a like fucking tradition at this point. Someone's going to tell me in the comment section below that I'm wrong about this. And I'm not. And those are five things that you've probably got wrong. I think I've got all of them wrong. I don't think I've ever fucked a Teferi's Protection up, but it's probably been a situation where I have, and I just didn't realise. If you know any others you want me to compile into a video, let me know in the comment section below, and I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.